Hello and welcome to Forgotten Sitcoms. Today we're going back to the mid-70s to have a look at what David Jason was doing in his pre-Del Boy days with Lucky Fella. Oh boy, oh joy, oh do dio dio do do dio dio Oh boy, I'm lucky, I'll say I'm lucky, this is my lucky day. As we discussed in our episode on Only Fools and Horses, which is available on this channel, David Jason spent the 70s in a state of being on the verge of a leading man. He was the up-and-comer. Everybody knew he had something special. And while he was playing second fiddle to Ronnie Barker at the BBC, and that's a fine fiddle to have, ITV were making several attempts to give him his own vehicle. The second of those was Lucky Fella, in which Jason plays Shorty Mepstead, a naive and shy young man who finds himself unlucky in love. I'm all right when I write it down. It's just when I talk, it seems to go all funny. Especially if I talk to a girl. And the words seem to go all peculiar. I know. I'm the same, yeah? only with boys. I can do 80 words a minute shorthand. That's really fast, you know. But when I really fancy him, well, I just go all tense. Do you go all tense when you're with me? Written by playwright Terence Frisbee, Lucky Fella has one major disparity from your typical sitcom. It has a continuous plot. This was not a case of setting up the characters and then finding your way back to the status quo each week. No, this show had an overarching plot line that ran through the entire 13 episodes. So, David Jason is Bernard Mepstead, referred to as Shorty in the credits, but not often in the show. His age isn't specified, but it seems safe to assume that he's supposed to be early 20s. He still lives with his mother in a small terrace home, in which he shares a room with his older brother, Randy. And that name is no accident. Played by housewife's bit of rough Peter Armitage, Randy is your typical 1970s alpha male. A man's man. He likes football, beer and birds. And the two are also complete opposites when it comes to their romantic lives. Bernard is looking for love, Randy is looking for the way out as soon as he's finished. Their poor mother resents their lifestyles as she's stuck with two grown sons still in her home instead of setting up their own. As she puts it, one of them is too clever to get caught, the other's too stupid. Mum? Is she your mum? He's my youngest. Honestly, there's no bloody privacy in this house. <laughs> my eldest. You what? You? What? Penelope! Arthur! Oh, do you two know each other? How nice! <laughs> know him? Of course I know him! He's my husband! You mean this is your wife? That's usual when you're married, isn't it? <laughs> You've been misinformed. No hard feelings. We wasn't doing nothing, Arthur. Honest, what a family. You should all be locked up. He was only showing me his long players. Come on! <laughs> let go with. The catalyst of the series' plot is Kathleen, played by Cheryl Hall. The family bump into her on a train ride, and Shorty is immediately smitten with the lovely young woman. Cheryl, however, only has eyes for Randy, with Shorty being immediately entrenched in the friend zone. And thus, we continue for the next 13 episodes with a few bumps along the way. And by bumps, I mean Randy and Kathleen sneaking off to some secluded area to get to know each other a little better. You know, actually, for 1976, this show is pretty frank with its sexual raunchiness. Obviously, we never actually see anything more than a bedroom door discreetly closing, but it's very clear what's going on in there. And just in case you weren't sure, the second half of the series revolves around the fact that Kathleen finds herself in the family way. So this is where Lucky Fella jumps out of our normal sitcom routine. This could easily be a show about a sad, pathetic loser man whose sexier older brother keeps upstaging him whenever he meets a girl, but Frisbee decides to give us a bit more continuity by making it the same girl every week. Shorty goes to increasing lengths to impress and win over Kathleen, never realising that she's only dating him to get closer to Randy. It's really quite tragic, and spoiler alert, it gets worse. When Kath finds out she's pregnant and Randy is the only possible father, hey, she's not a total slut, you know, the family come up with a plan. That plan is for Kath to finally give in to Shorty's pinings and agree to get married to him, he not knowing that she is already pregnant, of course. The wedding would have to be rushed through, but that's no problem, and then in the heat of passion she will seduce him, and boom, would you believe it, baby born, six weeks premature, Shorty never knows the difference. If this seems horribly manipulative and dishonest, then yes, you're right. But it was a different time. And you know what? They actually just about get away with it, thanks to good character writing and good performances. 
The crucial element here is that you do genuinely believe that the other characters care about Shorty. The idea of Randy doing the right thing and making an honest woman of Kath is never really entertained, but that is mostly because they see how much it would hurt young Bernard. Likewise, the general feeling seems to be that he'll never get a woman the normal way, so they may as well give him this chance for some kind of happiness. And Kath, meanwhile, she does genuinely see that Bernard will make a dependable and loyal life partner. She likes him, but... He just doesn't light a fire. He's the typical nice guy who's always picking up the scraps of the popular boys. It's just not usually this direct. Okay, look, they don't totally get away with it. It still seems like a pretty nasty thing to do to someone, especially as he ultimately just needs a bit more confidence and he'd be a perfectly normal, functioning member of society. Sometimes the way they speak about him suggests that he needs a full-time carer, and that's just not fair, especially when he's being constantly compared to his older brother, who has some sort of supernatural animal magnetism when it comes to women. But like I say, the characters around him are well written enough that you do believe they care. And this is in contrast to the pilot episode, which was made a year earlier and was unaired, but appears on the network DVD release. In that, we have different actors playing the mum and brother, and the mother in particular is a very different and much nastier character. This really wouldn't have worked over the long term of a series, and you can see sorry uh, for proof of how that would have gone. <laughs> That's right. Make difficulties. Take after your father, you do. Hey. You were even born difficult. Oh. <laughs> Bear down, they said, here's his head. <laughs> Some head, it was your bottom, wasn't it? The mother in the actual series is played expertly by Pat Hayward, a wonderful performance, and she's only about eight years older than Peter Armitage playing her son, but she strikes a perfect balance of a, a woman who's looking for a second flush of life in middle age. She's always trying to find a gentleman caller, but she can't bring him back to the house because her sons are there. Thus, she is frustrated by Shorty particularly, because he's the one hanging around alone at home all the time. But it's her son, it's her little boy, and she obviously cares about him, and she wants the best for him. When she conspires to trick Bernard into marriage, it's because she thinks that it will be giving him what he wants as well as helping her other son out of trouble. It seems like the perfect solution to her. And likewise, the brother who, once he realises how in love Shorty is with Kath, he immediately starts to shun her, despite her repeated attempts to get back in the sack with him. Okay, yeah, he gives in a couple of times. Look, he's only flesh and blood. But he too genuinely wants to put his brother first. So on paper, Kath should be the least sympathetic of the three. She very clearly and openly states that she's only putting up with Bernard to get to Randy, and she tries to jump him every chance she gets. But she does also want to be honest with Bernard, and, it, and it's a series of comic mishaps and a general sense of politeness that keeps him from knowing the truth about her lack of feelings. And she really does like Bernard. He's such a sweet boy. But girls her age, they don't want sweet boys. I won't spoil the ending, but the series does reach a climax, so to speak, and the plot is brought to a close. And this is partly the problem with a continuous plotline. You do have to tie it off eventually. So is this why the show only lasted one series? Not really. The show actually did very well, despite being put on a bit too early in LWT's schedules for its demographic. In fact, it seems ITV wanted another series, but Terence Frisbee didn't have much else to say with the characters, he wanted the network to repeat the show before he tried doing something new with them, and when ITV couldn't do this, he decided to let it go. In fact, according to the blog of Dominic Frisbee, who is Terence's son, this is the main reason why ITV struggled to keep up with the BBC in terms of sitcom popularity. They didn't have the same scope to put out repeats, so it's much more difficult to catch an audience with word of mouth. You know, in a time before video, if you missed it the first time around, that's it, you were done. And this is also why Lucky Fella has been lost to time, despite its contemporary success. By the time David Jason became a household name with Only Fools and Horses, and ITV realised they could get some traction from repeating his older work, they were too late. Jason had the contractual power to veto the showing of repeats, and this he did, much to the chagrin of his fellow actors who weren't in his position and could have done with the repeat fees. It seems like this was motivated by professional low self-esteem. You know, Jason wasn't happy with his performances as a younger man, and he would prefer them not to tarnish his image. To be honest, that seems a little unfair to me. This is an excellent performance in a well-put-together show. You know, even his other ITV shows, Top Secret Life, Vega Briggs, and A Sharp Intake of Breath, they're both creative, they're happy to play around with the standard form of the sitcom. There's some really interesting things going on there. And all these 70s shows really embrace Jason's skill for slapstick in a way that we never fully get a hold of in his later work. Is that something he was trying to put behind him? I'm not sure. 
But overall, Lucky Fella is definitely worth the watch. The continuous plotline does throw up some other problems, such as there's a feeling that, you know, there's definitely some filler episodes here. You know, normally, that wouldn't be a problem. Every episode in the sitcom pretty much exists in a vacuum. But here it feels like we're just treading water if the main plot isn't being advanced in some way. And maybe the actual comedy elements aren't always strong enough to hold the show on its own. There's some pretty classic sitcom set pieces, such as a washing machine overflowing, you know, which they then take to a ridiculous degree. And that's all well and good, but it's not the sort of thing that is going to stand up to repeated viewings or to, to create a legacy. And in terms of what came later, well, Terence Frisbee was primarily a stage writer. His only other sitcom was a similarly forgotten show called That's Love in the late 80s. That also ended up working with a continuous plotline to try and eke out a bit more from the characters. Cheryl Hall, of course, followed up Lucky Fellow with Citizen Smith, playing against her real-life husband Robert Lindsay, but since then she's not particularly specialised in comic roles. We do also see some familiar sitcom faces making guest appearances, such as Josephine Tucin in a sort of silly wig, and Prunella Scales uh, in a fairly unusual role as a rosy-cheeked farmer's wife. And of course there is another series regular in Glyn Edwards playing, would you believe it, an aggressive father. Well, we don't all go against type, do we? Obviously we all know what David Jason went on to do, and if anything I came to Lucky Fella, like most people, to see what he was doing before he became David Jason borderline national treasure. And I'm really impressed with what I've seen. The slapstick works very nicely, and it's something, like I say, I don't particularly associate with David Jason, falling through the bar notwithstanding. And Lucky Fella is a nicely contained piece. I would have preferred, say, 8 episodes to 13, but it still works, and the writing overcomes the inherent flaws with the characters where you shouldn't like them but do. Give it a try. I recommend it. And in the meantime, you can listen to one of our earlier podcasts in which we address the earlier series of Only Fools and Horses, or go and look at the other episodes in our Forgotten Sitcom series where we take a look at some shows that haven't stood the test of time. Thank you very much for watching.